Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. Uh, it wouldn't be the same if I didn't remind you of that. Remind you of that is what I meant to say. Uh, thanks for being part of the show, as always, and uh, thanks for everything that you've done to, to help promote it. Um, interestingly enough, since we have started uh, posting this show on YouTube as well, <clears throat> in, uh, in video form, um, astonishingly, uh, it's continued to grow and, and grow rather dramatically. So uh, very much appreciated. It goes without saying thanks so much. And we talk about the five F's here, and uh, it's important, I think, to to remind us always. And as usual, when I speak to you, I'm also speaking into my own ears. Uh, and that is that um, if your five F's are in good shape, you've got very little to complain about, right? If you have uh, a great relationship with a spouse and with your children, maybe with your parents, siblings, you've got a great relationship with your family, all aspects, everything that comes under family. Uh, if everything on the financial side, that's the second F, no order to them, and just the order I'm giving them to you now. Uh, the, the financial, everything's good. You're not being kept awake at night through financial stress. Um, you've got friends. We all need friends. And it is the wise wife who realizes that her husband also needs time with wholesome male friends. And uh, it's also the wise man who realizes that when he's picking a wife, he doesn't need and shouldn't be looking for a woman who will satisfy his every single need, including that of friendship, because she can't. She's restrained by biological reality. She is a woman, not a man. And we guys do need time with other men, and it's in our family's interests that we have that time. So uh, bear that in mind. So your family's in good shape, your finances are in good shape, your friendships are in good shape, your faith is in good shape. You actually have an understanding of a spiritual reality, and uh, you are forming or have formed a connection with God. That that's pretty good, and then fitness, your physical health, your your physical shape, uh, is it? If all of that is good, you've got nothing to complain about in life, right? It's very good. Now we all know that, so why don't we all have perfect lives? Very simple, because it's not simply a case of knowing it; it's got to be absorbed into the heart, and that comes partially through repetition, partially through doing, partially from hearing me emphasize it every single week. That's what helps move it, the very difficult terrain of 13 inches from my head to my heart, so as it becomes part of who I am. That's very difficult. And then it also requires that um, we are able to increase our self-discipline, that we are able to make ourselves do what we know we must do when we know we must do it. I think you'll agree that if you could achieve all of those things, you're in very, very good shape. And so you should know that this is a yeshiva, uh, yeshiva is the Hebrew word for a, a seminary, a study place. This is a yeshiva for developing all of that. That's what we're focused on, because there is nothing more I can do for you than those things. There's, no much, there's not much more I can do for you than help you realize that your future happiness and your future success depends to a large extent on your ability to impose your own limits on your own freedom. Just because we are capable of doing certain things doesn't mean you should be doing those things. Those can be things 
leading you into failure and uh, decline. Somebody uh, wrote to me recently. Remember, I did a show recently uh, speaking about masculinity, uh, testosterone, how the, the culture has been diminishing it. And this guy wrote to me, and it was very funny, actually. He said, um, <clears throat> he said, I don't know why you are encouraging us to become higher testosterone men. He says, every horrible mistake I've made in my life has been because of uh, testosterone. He said, uh, I'm older now, and I think my T level is lower, and I get into much less trouble than I used to. Uh, well, I guess that's the difference between toxic masculinity and real masculinity. And there are a number of other things people have written to me about that I thought would be a good uh, thing to talk about on the show. So this is a bit of an unusual show. I, it's, it's been a long time that, uh, that I've not done something like this. And what I'm proposing to do is to just tell you some of the questions people have submitted. These I've happened to have taken off of uh, YouTube, but uh, we also get questions on our website at rabbidaniellappin.com because it is over there that... Um, Many people listen and read. Many people join the conversation there. And also many people go to rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, where it says contact us, uh, you can also do just that. And so people contact us that way. Also, we have an Ask the Rabbi page at the website at rabbidaniellappin.com. And on the Ask the Rabbi page, we get submitted specific questions, and those we tend to answer uh, both audio and writing on the website. I'm not taking any of those in this show because those tend to be uh, longer and more complex. But I'll, I'll go with the ones that um, we, we have received, as I say, more, more of the short-form question on, uh, that have come on YouTube. So... Um, uh, here is an appropriate one to start with. David G. Uh, wrote, how about the sixth F, fun? Okay. Um, David, obviously you heard me talk about uh, the five Fs many times. Faith, family, friendship, faith, family, friendship, um, finances, and fitness. And you ask, well, how about adding another one, fun? And I very deliberately did not. Believe me, this is the result of careful analysis in ancient Jewish wisdom. I didn't just come up with this on the, uh, off, out of thin air. And fun absolutely does not belong. Now, I think you're probably trying to have some fun in, uh, in suggesting that because you can't seriously think that fun is in the same category as uh, finance, family, friendships, and uh, faith and fitness. I, I don't think you even believe that. But um, the, the, the point, sort of treating your, your question seriously for the moment, <clears throat> um, every one of these things, when you're working on your family and your finance, when you're working on nurturing and growing and increasing friendships and faith and fitness, you're doing things that are advancing your life. You're doing things that'll bring you success and happiness, deep joy, abiding real joy. And fun is exactly the opposite. Fun is essentially a relinquishing of responsibility and doing things that the lower part of us pulls us towards doing, generally speaking. Now, if you happen to be somebody who has fun building your business and your finances, then great, you're having it there. And the goal is to achieve that. If you get to the point where working out in the gym and exercising regularly is fun for you, terrific, you're getting that. But to introduce a separate category of fun, um, what could you possibly mean? What does that mean? Whereas all the other five, the real five, um, all are almost self-explanatory. Finances, I think you know what that means, right? It means don't spend dissolutely, uh, invest, save, find ways to enhance your revenue. I spoke about that last week in terms of inflation, eating up so much of the cash you hold. Uh, 
But if somebody says, go and have fun, <laughs> what does that mean? I get different things for different people. At any rate, it doesn't belong in those. If you were serious, uh, rest assured, these are the five you need to focus on, and you can forget fun. As a matter of fact, um, if if you are um, anywhere between the ages of 13 and 23, I think it's safe to say that fun shouldn't be on your radar screen at all. You've really got more important things to do. And if you're older than that, well, it's, it's pretty much also true. So uh, I'm not sure that fun is, is, is anything that belongs. I think what a happy warrior works on is beginning to feel that he enjoys doing the things that he should do and doing them when he should be doing them. I think that's what a happy warrior does. So uh, moving right along, um, this one isn't so much a question, but I found it very interesting. I've often said before that uh, given the choice, I think I prefer listening to things rather than watching them. And so this podcast, this show is and has been for years available on audio, but I've just recently started enjoying doing it on video as well. And I think I begin to see what this um, writer is, is referring to. He wrote the following and he said, I listen while driving. When I read that, I thought to myself, yeah, that's when I listen to shows. There are a number of uh, shows and individuals I enjoy listening to. I listen while I'm exercising. I'm on a uh, stationary bicycle. Uh, even if I'm out walking or, or jogging, I have my earphones in and I'm listening. Like, like everyone else, I pass on the roads. So uh, that makes sense to me. But here's what he says. And even though I don't do more than an occasional glance over at the phone while I'm driving, the video makes it feel more like I'm listening to somebody sitting beside me rather than a phone call. You know what? I, I think I kind of get that. I do think I get it. So, um, so I'm hoping that those of you who do uh, take in this show through the video no, as opposed to only, I, I'm hoping that's working well for you. And for those of you who continue to enjoy it just on video, on audio, well, we'll continue supplying it that way as well. <clears throat> um, here's the next one. These are not in any sequence. Dear Rabbi, thank you very much for all your hard work in this world of secular fundamentalism, having its claws all over the society. Helps me a lot to find the right way in this confused world full of off information spread around by socialist aficionados. I appreciate you emphasizing that money is a spiritual thing. For money to have a meaning, there has to be a voluntary transaction between two people who are through this transaction enriching one another. Yes, I agree with you. I agree that even if we had sound money but no willingness to help one another, it would be useless. But on the other hand, could you share your thoughts and wisdom on gold and silver? Because one has to have a solid, stable currency, uh, money, prices in gold are stable. Gold is real and eternal money. And whether people have trust in gold or not, it has intrinsic value. There is even gold in the electronics we are using, and that electronics is working whether, believe, whether we believe it or not. So uh, I think what uh, this listener is, is asking is for me, to speak a little bit about gold and silver. Look, um, the fact is that for the most part, our transactions are going to be largely conducted in currency, namely US dollars if you're in the United States and other currencies if you're elsewhere around the world. More than likely, that is what is going to continue happening. Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, etc., growing and more and more people and uh, organizations are willing to accept um, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in exchange for their goods and services. Um, gold and silver, well, that's a little, let's leave silver out for the moment. Let's just talk about gold. Gold is, um, it's very interesting. I mean, it, you know, why gold and not platinum? And I would submit to you that that is because gold is the first metal mentioned in the Bible right at the beginning in the book of Genesis. And uh, 
the Bible says, uh, speaking about four rivers that come out of Eden, and one of the rivers circles the land where the gold is, and the gold is good. And that is uh, the eighth time that the word good is mentioned. And uh, I have spoken about the number eight and its significance, also having to do with the eight days of the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah that usually falls in the middle of the winter, somewhere in December. And uh, it lasts for eight days, and Hanukkah has a lot to do with money and a lot to do with the Hebrew understanding of money and why it is that... uh, that Jews are disproportionately good with money. Uh, that's a whole discussion that I've had. But um, the, uh, the, the gold, yeah, I'm not sure there is another reason for gold. It was through that that gold became accepted. The fact is you can make jewelry out of platinum. You can make electronic connectors, uh, as he alludes to, with platinum as with gold. And, um, you know, gold has become over human history the the money the the metal that signifies money now i i i think it's great to to own a little bit of gold but i also would urge caution and and here's what i mean um i took the trouble of actually looking up some data on this cuz i wanted you to see um the price of gold um when um oh let's let's go to 2008 when um president obama was elected the price of gold at the time he was elected was approximately call it 850 dollars an ounce 850 dollars and it started going up almost immediately there was so much optimism in the Obama presidency. There was so much goodwill towards the first black president that the market reflected the optimism that everybody was feeling. See, gold is usually purchased at times of concern and worry, uncertainty. And so um, uh, gold suddenly started going up as soon as President Obama was elected at 850 uh, halfway through the term, it's at 1300 already. And um, at the time of the next, as we come up to the next election, it's at $1,700 an ounce. So if you had bought gold at the beginning, and again, I, I don't recommend, I don't think of gold as a, as a, uh, uh, as a growth investment, and I'll show you in a moment why that is. It is true that in that, during that period, it did go up almost double uh, during the first four years of the Obama presidency because everybody was so optimistic. But the increase started slowing down in the last uh, year of the presidency, and uh, and then it stopped. Then came the elections when uh, Obama won a second term. And from that moment, the value started plummeting and going all the way down. And the reason is because that first term of Obama did not live up to the promise. People were excited. People listened to what he said instead of listening to how he had conducted himself previously. And and they were burned. And... um, when he won a second term, there was enormous disappointment and worry and despondency, and the price of gold um, started uh, plummeting down. And um, until we get to the election of Donald Trump, and as Donald Trump begins to get elected, the price of gold starts going up until he is elected, and it keeps going up again all the way up until um, we approach the next election of his, uh, you know, the 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 end of his first term, and now it's at eighteen hundred again. So it went down at the at the end of the Obama presidency. It goes down all the way to um, a thousand, and. Uh, 
And then um, at the end of the first four years, the four years of the Trump presidency, uh, about ni 1900. Now, again, what's, what's, what's happening here is important to understand, and that is that people are bidding up the price of gold um, out of also a fear of what's happening. And so uh, a correct interpretation of what's going on is that people watched Obama get elected, and that was in uh, 2008, and here we are, and um, price of gold is $750 before the election, and then he is elected, and the price of gold goes up and up and up, signifying grave concern with what he's doing, everything he's doing. Um, comes the end of the first term in 2012, and um, there's very heightened concern. Socialism is being introduced to America, and uh, race tensions are being introduced to America. Paradoxically, everybody hoping that Obama would bring about a relaxation of race tensions, that didn't happen. He seemed to interpret everything in racial terms, and really a foresight, a little harbinger of what we were going to see from his vice president when he ascended to the presidency. But at any rate, 2012, President Trump becomes president, and as I told you, price of gold keeps dropping all the way down. Why? Because everybody saw what was happening to the stock market, what was happening to the economy, and people said, this is great. President Trump is pushing back on the socialism that was brought by Barack Obama, and so we do not have to put our money into gold. We can just leave it in currency. So the price of gold drops, and it goes all the way down to... Um, uh, where are we? 2015, it's all the way down to uh, $1,100 from a height during Obama of 1800 nearly 1900 So it's way down because there's comfort in the, um, uh, in the economy. President Trump loses the election in um, 2016, Excuse me. Um, in uh, he wins the election in twenty sixteen, and then because of the uh, uh, tremendous concerns uh, that were being manufactured, the Russian complicity and all kinds of things that were being told about him, nothing specific. Uh, but it was always what a terrible person he is. And again, fears, um, um, racial fears and everything else start growing until uh, 2020. Then uh, President Trump loses that election. And uh, at that point, the price of gold is nearly $2,000 an ounce. Um, it has since that time dropped and also risen. So, so it's been <coughs> it's been very volatile during the Biden administration during the last uh, year and a quarter. Very very volatile. My point is that um, if you are willing to hold gold not as uh, an investment that's going to increase in value, but as something that will rise and fall as fears rise and fall, but will never lose its value entirely. If it's not going to be something you are going to have to liquidate at a certain point, by all means, you should have some gold, but uh, not money that you need to be liquid because it does go up and down. Um, the lowest it's been in recent times is in uh, 2001. Um, 2001, here we are. And what it is there is $300 an ounce. And then came 9-11. And during that period, uh, it, the price of gold goes up. So it could go down, probably not to uh, 
you know, not to a point of, of zero. That's not going to happen. Gold does remain valuable and uh, it will retain its value. But uh, in terms of being able to do business and in terms of being able to function, um, I don't think using gold is going to be that effective and, and that useful. So my answer to that one is, yes, gold has intrinsic value. No harm in trying to keep some and have some, but not um, in terms of liquid money that you may have to obtain because it may be on a down. It is volatile and in, in dangerous times and in worrying times such as we now live in, uh, yeah, it's it could go up and down. Uh, in general, uh, with the very strong inflationary trend in the United States of America, I would expect it to go up. Um, I would think that is likely to happen, but the market may disagree with me. People may say, oh, well, it's already got a, um, a, a value fixed at where it is, and so it's uh it's it's already fairly high so it may just stay there in general i think probably with the inflationary uh, trend probably going up next question uh, rabbi lapin with all due respect listening to you it sounds like you are asserting that for males and boys and men there are no new and true alternatives or options to be discovered and explored and that unless a male boy man fits into the traditional testosterone template that you are prescribing he is somehow less of a real man and is therefore lacking in worth or value as a human being is this a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation uh, yes and no. Um, obviously, uh, I'm not going to ever say that somebody is less of a human being or has less value or is less of a man. Of course, I'm not going to say anything like that. Um, that's absurd. Naturally not. But at the same time, you're not misunderstanding me at all when I tell you that uh, there are no two new and true alternatives. Uh, boys and masculinity are what they've always been and always will continue to be. Look, you can shake a defiant fist at God, which is exactly what the transgender movement philosophically at root is doing. Uh, it makes absolutely no difference. And uh, unfortunately, for many sad people and for many troubled people, this true reality becomes apparent to many more people every single day people who have taken uh, dramatic surgical and medical steps um, are, for the most part, not happy. It is the movement encouraging them that, and that is driving them, that is um, moving this thing forward and, uh, and pushing it very dramatically. Um, so then somebody says, so where has all the world's gold accumulated now? Uh, okay, so the overwhelming majority of all the gold that's ever been mined is in existence. It, it doesn't vanish. Very, very little vanishes. You know, the occasional wedding ring that gets um, chopped up by the garbage disposal unit or gets thrown in the trash by mistake. Uh, the occasional um, little um, decorative thing in gold that gets lost and ends up in a landfill. It doesn't happen a lot. Overwhelmingly, the huge majority of all the gold that's ever been mined still exists. That said, by the way, you'd be surprised um, how little of it there is. If, if you were to put all the gold that's ever been mined in a big block, in one big single cube, and dropped it in the Grand Canyon, <laughs> you'd barely see it from the rim. Um, if you try to fill up um, a, if you if you took it into uh, a, a stadium, you know it would comfortably fit onto the playing field of a stadium. You don't have to worry. Uh, it's not as if the amount of gold that's been mined is this huge unman. No, it's it's just you know it's heavy, but there isn't that much of it in terms of uh, you know. Uh, uh, you can you can go to Johannesburg, South Africa, and you'll see huge yellow hills, man-made hills, which are called mine dumps. And these are man-made hills 
uh, made up of all the waste that's brought up out of the ground. And once the gold is extracted, this gets put into hills. And you can even see them from airplanes as you fly over what's called the, the Witwatersrand um, uh, that that area that stretches about uh, 70 miles uh, on uh, 30, 40 miles on either side of Johannesburg, um, the amount of gold, that all the gold that's been mined is not even as big as one of the large mine dumps. So it's, it's all around. You don't have to worry. It's there. Some of it is in uh, vaults, reserves owned by sovereign entities like nations. Uh, a lot of it is owned that way. Uh, a huge amount of it is owned by individuals. And uh, a lot of people like owning gold because of the privacy. Um, I I don't know exactly how anymore because things have changed, but it used to be relatively easy to buy gold off the record. Nobody need know you have it. I'm not sure if that's still true. Uh, but people like the privacy aspect, that it was possible to own considerable wealth and to keep it in a safety deposit box. Right? You know, you think of, of what a, a brick of gold is. Is If an ounce is $2,000, then 16 ounces is a pound. So only a one small brick, a pound of gold, is, uh, is worth over $30,000 right now. So people, uh, people liked uh, the, the privacy aspect. And, uh, and so whether it's in jewelry or whether it's in uh, national reserves or whether it's in bank vaults, um, or whether it's in private ownership, it's all it's all there. You don't have to worry. Nothing has vanished. Um, somebody writes a technical criticism that has nothing to do with what you are teaching. I keep hearing your microphone rubbing against your clothing as you move, and sometimes you bump it. It's a little distracting as you talk. Have you considered using a shotgun mic for recording your audio instead of a lavalier? Look, I really appreciate these criticisms. Um, you are certainly entitled to the very best kind of show I, I'm capable of delivering. And you are absolutely right. I had been using uh, a lavalier mic uh, for the video part of the show, although for the audio part of the show, I use a very high quality studio mic. Uh, but for the video part of the show, I was using a lavalier. I had no idea that it was rubbing against my clothing, and, and you're right, it's a problem. You suggested I use a shotgun mic, and guess what? There it is. Uh, that's exactly what we're trying out, and I very much hope that the, the quality will be improved and you will be happy with it. Um, Kathleen writes, I think the more masculine women act, the more men are not. Okay, and um, what she's referring to here is in a show that I did recently speaking about this, I explained that um, uh, the rise of the feminist movement was to a large extent precipitated by men stopping to be men. And just as nature abhors a vacuum, so it is that if men are not going to be men, well, women step in. And I've, I've seen this myself <clears throat> in my uh, marriage counseling and marriage coaching. Over the years, I've seen many, 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 many cases of men who um, diminished their capability for leadership. And because a family and a marriage needs leadership, if the man isn't going to supply it, the woman is. She's not necessarily happy doing so. She's not necessarily desiring to usurp his power. Generally speaking, that doesn't happen. She doesn't fight him for power and take it over. She takes over that power space that he has already vacated. And so um, uh, this was, um, uh, was Karen. Is that what I said? Uh, it was Kathleen. I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, Kathleen, you said, I think the more masculine women act, the more men are not. And I do not agree with that. I don't think that is the case. Uh, I think for the most part, uh, women react to men abandoning the leadership. And um, although uh, a, a woman who is 
uh, starting to date a masculine man, she might find herself, she might sort of kick and scream and resent his exertion of leadership and dominance and masculinity. Um, she's going to like it. And it may take a time for her to overcome her habits and overcome everything with which she was indoctrinated. And then at a certain point, she will, generally speaking, uh, find it very wonderful to be able to surrender that leadership role to uh, the husband. Uh, I was just um, listening recently to a wife um, speaking about who uh, they, this is a, a couple that boat, and so um, obviously we're, we're interested. And um, she was talking about um, in response to a question somebody had asked, she was talking about how much of the driving she does and how much of the driving he does on the boat. And she said, uh, well, you know, as a matter of fact, um, actually he does 95% of it. And you know what? I really appreciate that he does that. He takes the stress and the worry off of me. And she says, particularly when we're docking and moving around in congested waters, I really am very happy that uh, I can just move around the boat and, and relax. And she was really expressing exactly what I'm talking about here, Kathleen. Um, the, uh, the area is also true in money. And in spite of the fact that uh, women have been effectively indoctrinated by the feminist movement, and even though there are certainly reasons, it's a very, very difficult question. When you're raising your daughter, if you're raising a daughter, uh, do you want to make her financially independent? Do you want to encourage her to um, attain uh, the credentials and skills and experience for a high-paying job? You might say, well, you know, if heaven forbid she ever has to, she's divorced and she can't depend on her husband, you know, then she'll be very happy she has that. On the other hand, what if you felt or you heard me say at one point that um, doing that actually makes it less likely for her to find and sustain a happy, durable marriage? Now what do you do? You're damned if you do and damned if you don't. It's, it, it's, it's a problem, pardon me, it's a problem both ways. Um, but um, the, these, these are very, very difficult questions. But um, again, when a husband does the driving, when a husband takes responsibility for making sure that the family has the finances it needs, it's a huge relief. And um, and most women are grateful and show their gratitude by creating a family life that uh, that is beautiful and very rewarding. So in my view, we have an enormous amount of damage repair to do in society. But my responsibility is not to fix society, certainly not to fix the world. It's not to repair the universe. <laughs> no, my responsibility is to you. My responsibility is to the listener of the show. My responsibility is to the happy warrior community. And so because I know you can take the truth, I tell it to you in an unvarnished way, even though it flies in the face of popular culture and even may fly in the face of everything you thought you knew. But then if I was just massaging you with warm butter, you would find very little value. And, and that is why that when I speak about money, again, uh, I do not go with the usual popular culture. I tell you how I know it from ancient Jewish wisdom. And I'm not saying, believe me, that this is the truth. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is I have discovered it to be true. But what I invite you to do is hear me, absorb it. You don't have to believe it yet, and you don't have to make any changes in your life yet. But now start looking at reality around you, weighing up the world as you see it and as you experience it every day, and then ask yourself, hey, who sounds more right, Rabbi Daniel Lappin or popular culture? And then little by little, I think you will start seeing that I am telling you things, sometimes painful, but I'm telling you things that are true 
And I'm telling you things that are deeply helpful. And that's why it is that um, uh, here is, is something that uh, I really encourage and, and want you to be aware of. Um, it's called Prosperity Power, Connect for Success. And it's a two-hour CD program, right? And uh, here's the nice thing. You can either go to our website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and order yourself a copy of Prosperity Power Connect for Success, and it comes to you in the mail. Alternatively, you can go to the website at rabbidaniellappin.com and order Prosperity Power Connect for Success and uh, download it right away, there and then. In fact, you can do it as soon as you've finished listening to today's show, and you will then have Prosperity Power Connect for Success. And uh, the, the, the material and the contents are hugely important. Um, some of them uh, relate to the book of Ruth in the Bible, uh, which is a book that is connected to connection. And as you can see, Prosperity Power Connect for Success, it's very, very important, the secret of connection. Um, for instance, <clears throat> let's imagine that uh, you're somebody who uh, has, uh, you know, has built a career in bookkeeping. Right, you know, you you know how to keep books for small companies or individuals, and you do that, and you understand how these how bookkeeping works, and you're able to quickly tell anyone who hires you or employs you whether they're running at a profit or a loss, and you can tell them what the last week is like, and you can tell them what their current profit and loss looks like. You can do all of these things. Um, and you heard me last week speak about how the only way to defeat inflation is by building up another revenue stream, and you want to start a business, but you have no idea. Well, the secret of Prosperity Power Connect for Success is that all you've got to do is find your opposite number. You've got to find the human being who has a fantastic idea and knows how to do this thing, provide a service or build a widget, but has no idea of how to do the business side of things and has no interest in it and doesn't it hates filling out incorporation forms and hates dealing with insurance and hates keeping books and you connect and you build a business partnership and all of a sudden one plus one doesn't equal two one plus one suddenly equals 77,293 or some such large number because you multiply exponentially the effectiveness of your money-making ability when you connect with someone else. And so understanding that deeply is crucial to moving forward. Um, very, I, I just got a, a letter recently from somebody who um, is who has this idea of something he wants to do, but he has no clue about the money side of it. You know, he's, he's a, natural, a natural candidate for this audio program, Prosperity Power, Connect for Success, because, yes, he needs to learn how to find the right person and connect with that person in order to, uh, to enormously enhance both your F's of finances, yours and the other person's. <clears throat> now, uh, again, for those of you who prefer information by reading, well, I very much encourage, and, and I think you all know this, right? Now you see me, now you don't. Uh, these are the two books, Business Secrets from the Bible, Spiritual Success Strategies for Financial Abundance. These are specific steps everybody can take to start trying to generate a second or third revenue stream through a business. Uh, Thou Shall Prosper, The Ten Commandments for Making Money. These two books are really, really important. If you, if, if you resonate with me, if you get the five Fs, if you understand that, yes, uh, my faith and my family, my fitness and my friendships all tie into my finances, and you want to have a clear understanding of how to deploy all, all those things, then I 
have a lot to teach you, and I find considerable fulfillment in teaching you that material. Um, I thrive with the idea of our happy warrior community. I thrive at the idea that I here and now am in the process of conveying to you information that will be helpful. Because if you are improving your family life, you are automatically also improving your financial life. You may not see it right away, but believe you me, you will see it and uh, sooner rather than later. I explain a bit more of that in a free download book on our website. <clears throat> the book is called uh, The Holistic You. The Holistic You. And uh, it's it, 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 it teaches how you can absorb and understand and relate sp emotionally even to this idea that you are made up of five different areas. Your life story is made up of these five areas, and you need to work on all five in order to succeed, even though your focus may be just on one. Look, I know somebody whose focus was only on faith. That's all he was interested in. And um, it took me a long time to help him learn to understand that he also needs family and finances as well as uh, friendships and, uh, and um, uh, fitness. But it took a long time because initially all he wanted to do was spend all his time and effort on spiritual matters of faith. You can ruin a life like that in exactly the same way you can ruin a life by focusing only on finance or heavily. You've got to be symmetrical. Remember I spoke before about beauty has a lot to do with symmetry. And, uh, and here as well, a, a symmetrical development of your total being, hugely important. And that's why I never give the five Fs in any particular order, because none is more important than any other. That's really uh, something that we have to understand. Okay, um, I think uh, I'll do one more question. Um, okay. Um, so this question was on a podcast that aired November 25th, 2019. And here is the description. The description uh, reads, and by the way, you can see this yourself. If you just go to uh, the podcast and you find November 25, 2019, you'll be able to read this. How long would it take before a visitor to your home saw a shelf of books, Right. A lot of shelves of books. Why this really matters. You want to change your actions? Simple. Change your beliefs. Oh, I thought my beliefs are linked to my actions in another way. No. Uh, your soul abhors a vacuum. Uh, absent good beliefs, it'll readily embrace bad beliefs, and bad beliefs stimulate self-destructive actions. The real reason that certain courts no longer punish certain people for certain crimes. Yes, I talk about that. Uh, being depraved is not the same as being deprived. Talking about what brings about um, poverty. Is it being depraved or being deprived? And the answer is obviously being depraved. Uh, being deprived can be a stimulus for overcoming poverty and achieving financial success. Being depraved is a sentence of eternal lifetime poverty really is. Um, true companionship comes from shared beliefs, not shared skin color, obviously. Why actively nurturing a common belief system is a vital marriage maintenance program. Why Native American chiefs had names like Little Wolf, Red Horse, and Black Snake. Why merely regulating what people do is never sufficient for communist tyrannies. They have re-education camps in order to regulate what people believe. We have public schools, GICs, that is, government indoctrination camps, and universities, kindergartens to me, for the same reason. And so um, Dan wrote, Hi, Rabbi Lappin. I love listening to your series, Keep It Up. I was intrigued by a specific point which you bring up in many of your shows. You mentioned taking in ideas via your eyes versus your ears or reading. 
which I agree with. This, I assume, is probably why I feel like I'm listening to a radio episode when listening to you on here. Uh, just on a pedantic sort of note, how does live audience or interpersonal conversation fit that? How about presenting to a crowd of a thousand at a theater versus a video of the same event? Okay, so uh, yes, we've, uh, we have spoken about that, and it is correct. It is much more valuable to take in information through your ears than through your eyes. I need to stress something which you'd know yourself if you thought about it for a moment, and that is that when you are reading, you're actually taking in information through your eyes, even though you are you, your ears, pardon me, even though you are using your eyes as an intermediary to actually see the symbols on the page or on the screen that are that are symbols of words, and then it's through your ears, essentially, that part of your brain that the words get translated into thoughts and ideas. <clears throat> That's um, that is. Uh, important. So the trouble with seeing, with uh, learning or trying to gain things through the eyes is that it bypasses much of the cognitive processing of the brain and it becomes emotional. <clears throat> and so uh, this is one of the reasons that it takes so much less effort to watch a movie than to read a book. And so the lazy outcome is to watch movies instead of reading. <clears throat> that takes us back to the bookshelves. And so um, he asks about communicating on video. Yeah, um, I think it's the same thing where for the most part you are uh, listening to the words. You may be watching the video of the speaker or you may be watching the speaker on stage and the speaker may even have uh, slides that he displays. Uh, and that may well happen, but by and large, overall, you are gaining information intellectually, not emotionally, which is exactly the way you want to gain information, uh, particularly when you're weighing up business ideas or investments, uh, much better through words than through pictures. Uh, that doesn't mean that seeing a graph which gives you a pictorial representation isn't helpful. It is. And again, for the same reason, pictures are easier. They take less effort than words, but they come with huge disadvantages as well. And so uh, one of them is that uh, anybody can uh, create a, um, a graph to prove almost anything you want to, to prove. Uh, it's like statistics. So yes, um, eyes versus ears, very, very important. And that's one of the reasons that... Um, uh, audio, an audio book, for instance, is useful. It's a good thing, uh, just as reading the book is. And that's one of the reasons I think that audio books are doing so well and why it is that uh, more and more things are being um, made available and published in audio. <clears throat> in audio, pardon me, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm sounding a bit blocked up. <clears throat> At any rate, um, we, uh, I think we have to bring us in for a landing for today. Different sort of show, but uh, I hope one that brings you value as well. I really hope it did. And uh, I um, welcome your communications as always. I also welcome and encourage you to become part of the Happy Warrior community and uh, join us over at wehappywarriors.com. Please do that and uh, communicate and join in the conversation. And above all, make sure that you focus on your five Fs because happy warriors are not tennis balls floating down the gutter of life. We are not passive victims. We are active shapers of our own destiny. Remember, please, that the life you get is not the life you want. It's the life that is the result of the decisions and choices and actions you make, right? When, when one is young, one dreams, oh, this is the life I want. This is where I want to live. This is what I want to do. The way the world really works is that nobody cares what you want, it's only if you are capable of translating that want into disciplined choices, decisions, and actions that you will attain that life you want. And it's never too late 
to start improving in that area. You may not attain the life you dreamed of when you were 15, but you will do better than you would otherwise be doing if you don't. And so until next week, focus with laser-like intensity on your families and on your finances, on your faith, on your friendship, and your fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.